Hi, I'm Steve Selig, founder of FitTest, and in part one of this two-part series on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, the topic of this video is uh, what is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, both in terms of the pathology and the physiology, uh, what treatments and interventions are available, and more importantly for exercise professionals, some guidance around providing exercise interventions for those um, individuals. So first of all, what is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Uh, this refers to global or asymmetric left ventricular hypertrophy in the absence of increased afterload. That is in the absence of arterial hypertension or aortic stenosis, for example. And I've made videos on both of those topics, which you can go to. And um, it's used, uh, it's diagnosed using increased left ventricular wall thickness as the primary criterion. Left ventricular hypertrophy occurs due to mainly due to genetic mutations that affect cardiac uh, sarcomeres and results in pathological and often asymmetric thickening of the ventricular septum and or left ventricular free wall. Now coming to the pathoanatomy and the pathophysiology, just in very briefly, very quickly, um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is characterized by a small LV cavity in, uh, due to the muscle hypertrophy, not leaving enough room for the, uh, for the cavity, for the, for the ventricle, uh, that it's characterized physiologically as hyperdynamic systolic function. Now, the most important uh, pathophysiological and pathological element of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which has big impact in terms of delivering uh, designing and delivery exercise interventions is what is called the LVO2O or left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. That's quite a lot to take in. I'll show you uh, where that is on the next uh, slide with a diagram. But as you can um, imagine, left ventricular outflow tract, uh, which we've come across in other videos, such as, um, um, such as uh, aortic stenosis, uh, if there's an obstruction due to the muscle hypertrophy, then that creates havoc for the left ventricle. The left ventricle has to do more work. Left ventricular pressures are up, uh, systolic pressures, and even left ventricular diastolic pressures up, which interferes with, with um, a diastolic ventricular filling. So this really is an, a very important uh, element, pathophysiological and patholo pathological uh, element, and I'm going to return to this theme quite a lot in this presentation. I've just mentioned that there's impaired diastolic function. Now, what uh, some of the research has shown is that um, even in people with non-obstructive, that is in the, the hypertrophy that's not causing obstruction across the left ventricular outflow tract, there can be an increase in obstruction across the outflow tract immediately after exercise. Now, what this underlines is as an exercise professional, you can't actually measure this unless you're doing echo at the same time, and we're not doing that normally. Uh, but what you have to be aware of is that there may be some developing signs and symptoms occurring after exercise. So recovery monitoring is really important. And I emphasize this over and over and over again in all of the work that I do. And uh, it, it does amaze me sometimes that people forget the importance of recovery monitoring. And this is just an example of it. You need to monitor signs and symptoms during recovery. That, that doesn't mean going mad with over, over measuring, but it just means having some good symptom vigilance after someone finishes, especially a higher intensity um, a session of exercise. Now, coming to some of the physiology now, um, so to get together with the impaired diastolic function, the left ventricular outflow tract problems and the hypertrophy impair systolic function, and that's manifested as a drop in uh, stroke volume, both at rest and in exercise. So a lot of these patients present as heart failure, which is what really is what they are. Uh, and this will definitely impair exercise capacity. And this is showing how it impairs exercise capacity uh, and talking about aerobic exercise. We have uh, VO2 being the product of heart rate 
stroke volume and um, oxygen extraction at the tissues. Now, heart rate has um, uh, really doesn't play much of a role in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But what I want to outline um, or emphasize again is the folly of using heart rates to prescribe exercise for, for these patients and for so many cardiac patients. Many, many of my videos have emphasized this point, and this is just another example of the same thing. Please do not use heart rates to prescribe exercise. Now, we already have touched on the impaired stroke volume due to the factors I've already mentioned. And so what we rely on, the green light, if you like, we rely on an improvement or a, an increase in the amount of oxygen extracted at the tissues, particularly mitochondrial uh, usage of oxygen in the peripheral muscles. So our emphasis on exercise training, yes, to try and uh, reverse some of the impairment in stroke volume, how much of that we can do without medical assistance, such as uh, pacemakers and some of the pharmacology is very probably unlikely, but we, we can certainly uh, try to make the pump a better pump. And there's some evidence that I'll come to that touches on this later in this presentation, but we have a particular emphasis on the periphery in improving oxygen extraction of the peripheral muscles. And all of this should help to prevent uh, a very big impairment in oxygen utilization VO2. So just coming to left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, here we have uh, global, in this case, uh, this um, uh, cartoon shows global hypertrophy of the left ventricle. And in so doing so, the cavity size is impaired or reduced. We have, and that will impair diast left ventricular diastolic function in terms of filling, but also the systolic, um, there's a systolic impairment because this thickened muscle creates a, uh, a pressure gradient and a, an obstruction across the left ventricular outflow tract into the ascending aorta. So unfortunately, these patients have both impairments of the left ventricle in systole and also in diastole. And then it feeds backwards into the LA, the left uh, atrium, and that also will have impaired diastolic uh, function. And we see this very much in heart failure with uh, reduced ejection fraction or diastolic heart failure, where the left atrium has to compensate for what's going on in the left ventricle. Uh, obviously, there's a different mechanism here, but the physiology is, is similar. So really, the most important take-home message here is the impairment, uh, well, not the impairment, the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, particularly increasing during exercise, which is an, in early recovery, which I've already mentioned, leading to an impairment in stroke volume. And also the left ventricle has to do a lot more work. Now we come to some investigations, uh, uh, plus or minus treatments that can help exercise safety. Now, first of all, what we want, um, what is incredibly useful, uh, uh, cardio um, echocardiograms, especially in exercise stress, but if not, at least for rest. And as part of normal cardiology, ca cardiologist investigations before referral to us as exercise professionals. So we don't do the echoes, but if you can get an echo from your referring doctor, whether it be a GP or a cardiologist, and almost certainly if someone's got HCM, they will have had uh, echoes done. And if you can get hold of that information, it's incredibly useful. That will uh, give you reports on how much left ventricular hypertrophy is going on, left ventricular ejection fraction for a sort of class helping to classify heart failure. Really importantly is the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Is it there? Did it increase with exercise if that information is available? Uh, and then diastolic and systolic function and also comorbid cardiac uh, disease. Uh, such as valvular disease, which can make these things worse, and of course, coronary artery disease. Now, if you can get all this before referral, fantastic. This will add prognostic value and make exercise safer. But I just want to emphasize that there are no quantitative guidelines or cutoffs from, say, an echo report that would contraindicate exercise. So I think you have to approach this from the point of view that you are going to provide exercise for these patients but it's really handy to have this information to guide you in terms of whether you're going to go mild, moderate, 
or uh, even um, high intensity exercise and, and high volumes. Now, there has been a report uh, re uh, fairly recently, and this is now part of clinical practice, that patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who do engage in regular exercise but have mild or no symptoms, a prophylactic prescription of beta blockers may actually prevent or inhibit the development of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction triggered by acute exercise, in other words, single session of exercise, and the research is showing that this may reduce the burden of disease in these patients. And not in this paper, not in the history paper, but elsewhere, uh, there, there are, um, there's quite a lot of information on calcium channel blockers being effective in terms of the overall pathophysiology and exercise physiology for these patients too. Now, we've already mentioned that stroke volume fails to augment in most hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients during exercise and helps to explain why we need more O2 extraction at the periphery via mitochondria in the muscles uh, during exercise. And that's a reason, a, a target for training. And if the, But the, the issue um, is if there's also a left ventricular outflow tract obstruction that increases in response to exercise, which is not all patients, but some, then all of this becomes worse and the stroke volume uh, even is even uh, more of a problem in terms of failure to augment. Interventions that decrease the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction improve symptoms. I've already mentioned beta blocker in that, but also septal myectomy is, um, is a very commonly used <coughs> surgical procedure for these patients. Elevated left ventricular um, um, filling pressures after exercise, uh, if that happens after exercise, and again, this is in recovery from exercise, watch out for symptoms, symptom vigilance. I keep saying that. Early development of chronic um, heart failure with normal ejection fraction, that's what is associated with these increases in early diastolic, um, uh, or sorry, uh, early recovery uh, filling pressures in patients, and it is diastolic filling pressures. Um, in non-obstructive patients. Now we come to some of the more, uh, the theories around connecting exercise with sudden cardiac death. So uh, the, the, the risk with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the wrong hands with the wrong advice is that there is an acknowledged real risk of sudden cardiac death, which we want to, clearly we want to manage this. Uh, minimize this to the absolute uh, nth degree. And so some of the theories around the connection between acute exercise uh, in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and sudden cardiac death are, are the following. So there's an increase in left ventricular outflow tract pressure gradient. That is the amount of obstruction across the left ventricular outflow tract, causing the left ventricle pressures to go much, much higher in uh, exercise, during exercise, and I'll have something more to say about that later in the presentation, increasing work of the heart and can cause myocardial ischemia acutely in response to exercise. There is some, despite the small chamber size, there is some biventricular stretch um, put on with exercise. That goes for everybody, but it'll be more of a risk for these patients. There's not, nothing you can do about that. You just have to manage it, try and manage it. Uh, manage the symptoms and stop if people become symptomatic. We know that there's a shift towards sympathetic dominance over vagal as they go to exercise, and any or all of these could cause life-threatening arrhythmias. Uh, chronic uh, exercise may cause uh, cardiac remodeling, um, which can increase a myocardial fibrosis and myocardial disarray and that can cause arrhythmias at all as well. So the arrhythmias can be in response to a single exercise session or in response to cardiac remodeling. Now, the conventional wisdom based on expert opinion rather than randomized controlled trials or, and or level A evidence uh, was to limit exercise and physical activity to no more than moderate intensity and moderate volume due to risks of sudden cardiac death. But those with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who avoid exercise altogether 
due to a fear of sudden cardiac death are now susceptible to lifestyle illnesses, including conditions such as coronary artery disease, hypertension, type 2 diabetes. So we need to find a way to exercise these clients safely at higher intensities and volumes to decrease the overall mortality and morbidity, knowing that there is a small increase in risk of sudden cardiac death uh, due to the actual primary condition. So it's really a balancing act here. And I think if you're vigilant in terms of signs and symptoms, that's a really good way to go. And I'll have more to say about that in a few slides. Now, until recently, the American um, uh, College of Cardiology Foundation and the American Heart Association guidelines for HCM patients who wanted to engage in competition or competitive sports, uh, these were the guidelines were to restrict these to moderate intensity, non-contact, non-combat walking sports such as golf. But there is currently not enough evidence, or there is currently not enough evidence to definitively change this guideline. So this is the guideline that we still have, and it'll be interesting to see if this changes over the next few years with more evidence. So coming to some more of the research around exercise is that long-term vigorous exercise in this paper by uh, De Degard showed an increase in diastolic, an improvement in diastolic function and a decrease in arrhythmias. Um, and it, uh, now we already know that an in increase in left ventricular outflow tract obstruction can arise in response to acute exercise and be absent or non-obstructive at rest. So this is really just re-emphasizing the point I made earlier about the a cardiologist normal investigations using echo, uh, especially streco, st stress echo is in incredibly useful, but not essential to us as exercise professionals. When we go to prescribe exercise, type, frequency, duration, and intensity of recreational exercise should be provided uh, to most, if not all, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, this next sentence really guides me. Uh, a good idea is to gradually up, to, up titrate exercise intensities and volumes, so long as there are no adverse signs or symptoms or adverse events. So it's really about sign and symptom vigilance along the way. In the first few weeks or months of a new exercise intervention, in other words, a new client uh, or a new intervention, make sure that you regularly assess your clients for current or improving exercise capacity. And I'm just doing a free plug for my app, uh, myfittest.com.au here which will be perfect for doing exactly this um, and then monitor your signs and symptoms. So if you go to myfitness.com.au, you can find a stack of information on this. Um, low exercise capacity, that is low VO2 peak in HCM patients, correlates strongly with increased morbidity and mortality. And so improving VO2 peak should be a goal. Exercise. Now, coming to the summary now, which is based on all of the references that I've read for this presentation, and I've got a full reference list at the end of this presentation. The first point is that exercise is good for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but they should seek the advice of an expert exercise professional and a client-centered approach, obviously using empathy, empathy and respect for that per person's personal circumstances, that's a given. Biventricular pacing, which I haven't mentioned till now, which is also known as cardiac resynchronization therapy or CRT, can help both atrial and ventricular performance during exercise and perhaps safety from arrhythmias too. But just note that not many patients will have these. Uh, to get, take that point further, implantable cardioversion defibrillators add even more safety if you like, but even fewer of these patients will have these. Echocardiograms, which I've mentioned over and over in this presentation, performed by cardiologists prior to referral to an exercise professional will provide excellent prognostic and advice around exercise, really inform the exercise prescription. Now, what I wanna just um, say in, in this part of the presentation is that if you know what the pressure gradient is across a left ventricular outflow tract, uh, if you know, then you can adjust brachial artery pressure measurements 
to interpret them in a different way. Now, I'm not going to go into how that is done because I've made lots of videos on this topic. And if I would recommend you go and look at my videos on aortic stenosis and apply the same sort of methodologies and interpretations on brachial artery pressures uh, that will inform you. Now for safety, up tight trait, your exercise intensities and volumes slowly over several weeks or month, months, adjust up or down according to the occurrence of adverse signs or, or symptoms and or adverse events. And each up titration effectively becomes a new assessment. And again, recommending my app, myfittest.com.au. And even there's some emerging evidence, not enough to go into guidelines yet, that high intensity exercise may be safe under certain circumstances for certain patients. Single lead ECG, such as available now on some smart watches and the live core, um, can be used for pre-exercise and peak exercise, but not during exercise. Peak exercise, meaning you stop exercise and then you record an ECG pretty much immediately within the first 30 seconds. And these can act as surrogate indicators of something else going bad, effectively the canary in the coal mine. Now, this is our model that we, uh, myself and some my colleagues developed a few years ago about uh, pre-screening. So this is the early sessions. Now, in the case of an exercise professional for HCM, we're really looking at this left-hand pathway rather than some of these other pathways. You certainly don't want self-referrals um, and you really don't want case manager referrals. You really want GP, medical referrals, GP, and in particular, cardiologist referral or a GP referral that accesses or provides information from the cardiologist. Now, that can be accredited exercise physiologist or uh, phys physiotherapist, physical therapist, using clinical reasoning and assessments, which I've talked a lot about in this, in this, um, uh, in, in this presentation, Adver looking for adverse signs or symptoms. If there's yes, then you need to loop them back because that means that they're really not safe for exercise and they need to loop back to the uh, referrer. But if not, then you can proceed safely and gently and uh, progressively to commence exercise. Now, this uh, decision triangle down here is so often ignored, and I just want to emphasize it again, you need ongoing sign and symptom vigilance when someone is already in an exercise program. This is not about set and forget, not about working out there's no symptoms here, therefore there'll be no symptoms ever. Uh, you really need ongoing sign and symptom vigilance and be prepared to send them back to the referrer if something arises. Now, this is just to summarise some of the emerging evidence around uh, moderate intensity exercise training, and I'm really focusing on aerobic training here, but it could be um, a resistance uh, coming to this as well. But these papers were more on the aerobic side of it and high intensity exercise training. For moderate intensity, the reports here were less arrhythmias if the person became fit and less adverse events, including ICD shocks. For the high intensity, um, the emerging evidence, it's not in the guidelines yet, but the emerging evidence from small trials and even medium-sized trials, uh, improvements in diastolic function, improvements in uh, end diastolic uh, volumes and reductions in end diastolic pressures, which is the diastolic part of this. This is diastolic. Uh, left, uh, um, even decrease in left ventricular wall thickness as the ventricle becomes larger decrease in, and that will have the probable benefit of decreasing the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and decreasing those pressure gradients during systole across any obstruction, decreasing LV pressures both in diastole and importantly in systole, and therefore probably being anti-ischemic. Um, uh, there's no evidence yet on fibrosis, that's the chronic uh, fibrosis and there's limited evidence on arrhythmias. So here are the references that I uh, accessed to uh, provide this presentation for you. There's more here. And then here, we've got some other resources from the American College of Cardiology, and then a very nice presentation, which you can access here. This is a, 
uh, a video presentation from Radcliffe Cardiology, beautifully done on emerging therapies, which are not in clinical practice and they're not in the guidelines, but it's really good if you're interested in looking at where the emerging therapies are, particularly with myosin uh, inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. So thanks for watching this um, presentation. And um, as always, you can access uh, my videos. This video will be up on my website uh, and as are all of my videos on various pathophysiological topics for cardiac um, conditions and how to and guide you on exercise. So um, you can look at all my videos on your phone, but if you go to become a subscriber, it's best done on a laptop.